So um, welcome everyone to the Beltway Vibe event um, with Yiska Smith. We are absolutely delighted um, to welcome her here with us today. So first of all, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ruth Friedman. I serve as the Maharat at Ohev Shalom in DC. Um, we are a part of the Beltway Vibe with, of course, Gilat Pardes in Aspen Hill and Congregation Beth Shalom mm -hmm. in Pomenik. And so it's wonderful to see all of you here virtually and really, really wonderful to have you Scott Smith here with us today. Um, we're trying to, to make lemonade out of the lemons of the pandemic and use it as an opportunity to welcome scholars from all over the world, um, Yiska lives in Israel, uh, to, to be with us. And so we thank her very much for coming. When I um, when we were, Rabbi Herzl and I were thinking, okay, which amazing scholars can, can we think of? I realized how out of touch I am with the Israel world. And so I asked my sister who lives in Nahlaot, who are some amazing scholars, you know? And she said, Yiska Smith, she's my show buddy. And so, <laughs> um, and then the next day as luck would have it, I got a Pardes email um, advertising some of Yiska's work. And I said, okay, this is incredible. Let's invite her. And I'm so grateful that we were able um, to have this and to be able to put it together. And thank you so much for coming and really delighted that it's also a Beltway Vod event and we're able to join our communities um, together. And welcome to everyone else who saw it on Facebook or what have you. Um, so hopefully you saw the information about Yiska on the flyer and hopefully some of you were able to watch the incredible documentary about her that we linked to as well. Um, she is a renowned spiritual activist, mentor, teacher, beloved, beloved by so many. Um, and we wanted really to, to be able to have this special event um, to talk about finding spiritual light. We know that it's a particularly dark time as the days literally are getting shorter as the virus is growing exponentially, at least in the United States. And there's a lot of uncertainty looming ahead with holidays, you know, the winter, having more holidays alone potentially, or at least not with, with people in the way that we're accustomed to. And um, we, we thought it'd be wonderful to have you, Scott, here with us to talk about both her own journey in times of darkness and also some tools that she can provide us for how we can we can nurture our own inner spiritual light. And so the structure of today's um, so first of all, this is being recorded and the structure, but you can you can put things in the chat um, if you would like. Uh, the structure of today's event is that she wanted to open with a little teaching from Rav Cook. And then um, there are she, then we have some, some questions that I will then be asking her um, as a frame for having a conversation about, about all of the, the wonderful things she has, she has to teach us. So if there are any questions, um, Yiska, would you prefer that people in, ask questions as they come or that they enter them in the chat or wait for the end? Uh, I think as we move through Okay. rather than at the end, because this way it can be more interactive. Beautiful, great, okay. Yeah. Are, would you be ready for me to share the Rav Cook teaching? I just want to say hi to everyone. Shalom, baruchot haba'ot, baruchim haba'im. Shalom and greetings from Nachlaot in Yerushalayim, where your sister, Rabbi Ruth, and I are shul buddies. When we used to dominate shul, we used to be shul buddies. We're still buddies, though. We're still good, good friends. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for extending such an honor to me to uh, share a piece of my soul with all of your souls, a piece of text, some life experience, perhaps some guidance. Um, it, it's, it's just such on. So thank you all in the Beltway Vad, a true, a true zechut for me, a true source of gratitude. Yeah. So on that note, because I'm an educator, uh, along with many other different hats that I wear, uh, I'd like to begin with a short teaching to get us into the right space, into the right mood. So it's a short teaching, but it's a profound teaching. It, uh, it, it really meant a lot to me and it continues to really mean a lot, not only to me, but to a lot of my students, to a lot of my clients. I have a private spiritual mentoring practice where I provide spiritual guidance for individuals. And I refer to this teaching a lot. It's based <clears throat> on a, the commentary on the Haggadah. Rav Cook wrote incredible 
very deep, very expansive. Uh, he, as we all know, he was such a prolific writer. And in his introduction to his commentary on the Haggadah Shal Pesach, he discusses the difference, at least how he understands it, the difference between Ha'evdel Sheben Ha'evet Uven Ha'chorin. What is the difference? He's asking the question here in Yerushalayim. He passed, as many of you may know, in 1935 here in Yerushalayim. And while we are recounting at the Haggadah, the historical, the historical event of moving from Abdut to Chayrut, when the Bnei Yisrael, when the Hebrews came out of Mitzrayim, what does it mean for us today, other than just honoring and really holding holy space for our own holy history? So he discusses that. So I'll read it in Hebrew. You have the Hebrew and the English. I'll kind of translate as I move through it. He says as follows, Ha'evdel she'ben ha'eved u'ven ha'chorin. The difference between a slave and someone who is free, it's more than just a difference in status or one situation. So in this case, one would be subservient to someone and one would not be. We're able to find a, an Evid, someone who's enslaved and educated and enlightened. It doesn't mean when he uses the word maskil, he's not referring to what degree the person may have. It means the person is smart enough to have cultivated something going on within one's inner self. So even though he or she may be enslaved physically, this person has the spirit that is filled with freedom. And there's the opposite. Ben Chorin, there can be a free person, but that person's spirit, that person's inner being is the spirit of feeling enslaved. It's more of a consciousness here. So then he begins to give the example of each. And I just want to point out, when I first learned this several years ago, the example of people who are enslaved physically, but have the spirit of being free, I thought back to the um, years ago in the 1980s, I was living in the Jewish quarter, not to, not Nachlaot then, but I made Aliyah in 1985. And I remember when Natan Sharansky was freed and he came to Israel and from the airport, he went right to the Kotel. I've never seen the Kotel like that. Even on all the Chagim during the Birkat Kohanim, I have never seen the Kotel like that. And then of course the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union broke down, and there was this onslaught of people who were enslaved, so to speak. They did not have freedom of movement. And for several years after many of them moved here, especially the leaders of the Refusenik movements were interviewed by different publications and they spoke at the universities and other different other platforms, they were asked, how did, you, how did you do it? How did you last so long in Siberia and under such harsh conditions, all because you applied for a visa to come to Israel? And the common reply was, only my body was enslaved. My spirit was already in Israel. I was a free person in Israel. Now, I don't know if these people read this Peyrouche from Rob Cook or not, but when I read the Peyrouche from Rob Cook, that's what it made me think of. All those wonderful people that somehow were able to muster up, something was going on inside and they would not be defined by external circumstances, which is something I wanna address later, not to be defined by external circumstances. So he continues. He 
אותה הרוח הנשאה. So what is characteristic of freedom is the exalted spirit, the ruach hanisa'a, she'adam v'chein ha'am. And this is, very, this is very traditional with Rav Cook. He'll teach to the individual and he'll also teach to the budding new nation because although he wasn't alive for the actual hakamat medinat Yisrael, uh, you know that moment before sunrise, he, that's when he was alive. He saw the rays from beyond already beginning to shine. So he makes references not only to the individual, but also to the nation. The person or a nation in general becomes exalted, becomes raised through one's exalted soul. Liot ne'eman la'atzmiut. And for me, these were the real words that like just found an immediate home within my soul to be faithful to one's inner being. And what is that? The spiritual disposition of having been created in the image of God that is within each one of us. And I want to repeat that word, to be faithful, to be faithful to that. A person can then feel that one's life has a direction, has meaning, it's per, one's life has purpose and is worthwhile. This is spiritual medicine. This is spiritual healing to build up a spiritual self-esteem with humility, with gratitude, with celebration. To know that I was created in the image of God, to know that my soul is the image of God in which I was created and to be faithful to that. Okay, what about the opposite? Masha'ain Cain. What about someone who's free, physically free? No government is directing or controlling one's freedom of movement. They're free in terms of their status. They're not enslaved to anybody, but their spirit is. In this case, the content of the person's life is not illuminated by one's soul. Ki'im, rather, v'mashahu yafev v'tov etzel ha'acher. Rather, that which is deemed pretty, nice, good, acceptable by the other person, by something else. Hashelet love that actually governs rules over the person. It could be any type of governance over the person. It could be legal, like in like I remember in different countries, especially like in China or in these other countries where even though people have freedom of movement, the government really decides like how many children you're allowed to have, what acceptable dress is. They, they, how you're supposed to think, how you're supposed to speak. That's Rishmit, but also it's no sweet. It's the very culture. And I see this all over the world. I see it in Israel. I see it in the United States. I see it in Europe, that people are free to move about as they wish, but they're not maintaining fidelity to their inner being whatever they decide to dress, whatever they decide to eat, wh whatever they decide is good, whatever they decide is nice, it's not really them that's deciding. It could be the media, it could be the expectations of the community they're living in. Whether it's a Jewish religious community, a non-Jewish Christian community, uh, it doesn't matter that people are making the choices in order to please, in order to be accepted, in order to be included by the other. And it's at a very 
very, very high cost. It's their own fidelity to themselves. So that teaching, uh, that's the teaching. It's in the Haggadah Shal Pesach, Im Purishei Olat which is actually the main book of Olat was the uh, the Rav's Perushan Tefillah. But this is where uh, the Perushan the Haggadah is included. All right, so I, sh I share that teaching with you with the blessing that, we're, that we all uh, are free, that we cultivate inner freedom, that we cultivate no matter what, and it could be frightening, it could be this, could be fear, there can be consequences, collateral damage. But at the end of the night, each one of you, as with me, we each have to go to sleep when we put our head on the pillow with our own conscience. So I think there's a saying, a pedestrian saying in English, I rather succeed, wait, no, I rather fail at trying to succeed than succeed in trying to fail. So Whatever mistakes we may make, whatever obstacles may, we may incur, at least try. At least try. You may surprise yourselves. So that's my teaching. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, and, and so, like I said in the beginning, um, that was sort of a, an introduction um, to get a, a sense of a background and a framework of what Yiska brings to us um, in her Torah today. And uh, so Yiska, as she will share um comes to this this field of spiritual growth and, and and renewal um through her own life experiences and so we thought that she would speak about her own life experiences and then segue from that into to speaking about tools that that we can all have um to try to get through the darkness ahead of us um so Yiska, i'll begin with the question of so as i mentioned in the beginning and as we advertised um she is the subject of a recent award-winning documentary um, about her life and her personal <clears throat> story. And so uh, I would ask you, Iska, to please share a little bit about that um, and why after your life journey um, and so many of the, the trials that you've been through, you agreed to have a documentary made about your life. I'm not hearing you. Oh, are you okay? Yeah. So you yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. So uh, before I answer the question, why I agreed to engage in this project, it was a several-year project. Uh, I just want to um, share with you, Baruch Hashem, the acknowledgement. Aside from the Jewish film festivals around the world picking it up, of course, now it's being streamed, rather than. I, you know, of course, in person, but it was a very big honor that the Polish International Film Festival screened the documentary, and it won the best documentary of the inter the Polish International Film Festival. And so much of it has to do with my own uh, inner conflict with wanting to really maintain fidelity to my inner being, sensitivity to my spirituality, wanting to honor the Jewish tradition, and at the same time, wanting to be authentic about who I was. And, it was, and it, there was like this intersectionality of such conflict where these three paths met. And yet I find in Poland, at a non-Jewish film festival of all countries, one of the, the country, one of the countries with the most severe anti-Semitic history, that's the country that this documentary won the best documentary of their, of their uh, festival. And one of the Rebbe's that I teach a lot, the Piasesna Rebbe, the Ish Kodesh, actually he was from Poland. He, his last safer that he wrote, Ish Kodesh, was written in the Warsaw Ghetto, and he perished in the Shoah in 1943. So I almost feel like he, he's really my Rebbe, and he's sitting up there in Gan Eden saying, you know, you go, you go, girl, right? You, your documentary won in, in Warsaw, the best documentary in this non-Jewish international film festival. That being said, um, and it is a source of gratitude, yes. Why did I agree to do this? Well, <clears throat> There were the, the two, the couple who were the film writers and the producers, 
Well, actually, yes, DACA was the actual financial producer, but the people who created this, Racheli Rusinik and Ayal Ben Moshe, they came to one of my lectures several years ago that I gave in Yerushalayim. I gave a series. We have what's called the Onat Tabut Yerushalayim. It's the season of culture in Jerusalem. It's a, usually a several week a multi-tiered event in Yerushalayim before the Chagim. And if you do see the documentary, I hope all of you will see it, or many of you have seen it. At the very end, it shows me giving one of those lectures. And at the end of every lecture, I would always give my card out in case anyone would want to follow up for spiritual mentoring, meet for a cup of people. Israelis came from all over Israel just because they were in Yerushalayim. Actually, most of them who attended did not even live in Yerushalayim, as with this couple. So they took my card, okay, as many other people did. And then we had the Chagin. This was in 2016, it's now 2020. So I get a, I receive an email shortly after the Chagim, after Shemini Yatzeret, Simchat Torah. Hi, our names are blah, blah, blah. We heard one of your lectures in Gan Saker and we're interested in meeting for a cup of coffee. We are documentarians and we're looking to write a new documentary. And we're thinking maybe if you would want to discuss, you could be the subject of the documentary. Okay. So I wrote them back and I said, okay, a cup of coffee, as long as it's in Yerushalayim, not where you live, what do I have to lose? I'll meet two people. So we met and I told, I asked them why. I said, why would you want to do a documentary about my life? I have already written my memoir, my book. It's out there. It was published in 2014. I've given a TED talk. That's out there in the world. Why do you want to write a documentary? And they said, because what we can do in a documentary, you could not do in your book, nor the TED Talk. I said, what is it you can do? We could show the depth. And they used language that, that that's my language, because I was not interested in sensationalism of someone who was born with gender identity dysphoria and what that meant moving into the Orthodox world and to Chabad and moving to Israel and all of the, all that, that external drama. That's not what I wanted to be a part of. They said to me, when they read about me and they heard my TED talk, they realized there's depth. There's a global message for everyone, for Israelis, for people who live outside of Israel, for Jews, for non-Jews. These people, by the way, are called in Hebrew, Chilonim. They're not Shomri Shabbat. They, they have a lot of regard for the tradition. But what they saw in it was my, my inner struggle with wanting to be at peace. It had nothing to do with the gender. The gender was one of the few things I was clear about. It was how do I honor that and keep halacha, keep the Jewish tradition, express more of my spirituality through text and through meditation and contemplative practice, and at the same time be authentic. As we say on every Shabbat, we say in the Shemona Esrei, in the Amidah, You know how many times on Friday night, Shabbat morning, Shabbat afternoon, I said those words and I had nuts in my stomach. So I said, if that's what you want to tell the story about, I'm in. But if you start going off into sensationalism, I'm out. And they kept their word. They're real artists. I'll tell you when the film was, I saw the film, of course, during the editing stages, I was, I cried. I said, oh, that's about me? I mean, they really, they, even at the music was custom written. They, it was just done so well. So they did the filming from, from like right after the Chagim in September, early October, 2016, until the Chagim 2017. So they filmed me, they were like a shadow wherever I went, <laughs> they were there. I was teaching, I was shopping for a dress, I was walking through the Jewish quarter with a girlfriend. I mean, you, you name it, I led a meditation. They were with me, of course, with my permission. So they finished, the, they finished filming in 2017, it took them a year and a half to edit. And in that time, they applied for um, 
they apply to Yes Daco, which is the major producer of documentaries in Israel. And it was a, it was a win for them. It was the first, they were a young couple, first documentary that they actually were able to have produced by Yes Daco. So that means Yes Daco saw something. They saw something that uh, was worth their investment. And it was not sensationalist. It was real, a, a documentary with content. So that's why I decided I wanted the people to be able to see a resonance with their own lives through this documentary. I was, I, it was really the, for the bigger picture, not just a story about me. It's a story about all of us. We all have inner contradictions. We all angst over something going on inside. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, uh, that's something I, I, I really admire about your approach is that you have an incredible life story, but it's it, you always trying to take it to the next step of how can we use that, like, you know, as, as a model for, for other people and other struggles as well. Um, so I do want to ask a couple more questions um, about the, the documentary. Um, so I mean, maybe and maybe also you can, um, you know, I don't want to assume everyone here has seen it. So maybe if you can share another a um, couple sentences also about more about, about your story and what exactly is showcased in the documentary. Um, and also talk about how, if it has changed your relationship with your family, um, how it has done so and how the documentary has impacted the relationships in your life. Yeah, so <clears throat> the filming, as I mentioned, the filming stopped, it ended in the fall of 2017. At that point in time, that's a little over three years ago, I have six children. I've been divorced for many years. I've been divorced longer than I was married. And I was married almost 18 years. Uh, I have six children. Most of them are married. They have children. I'm a grandparent. And I didn't know my grandchildren. And my children had very little to do with me, if, it, if anything. Uh, an email from time to time, Chag Sameach, Shana Tova, not really, uh, they preferred that it was hard for them. There was shame, there was embarrassment. <clears throat> Five of the six are Shomer Shabbat. Uh, none of them are Haredi, none of them are Chabad. So this is not because of being ultra-Orthodox. They were very uncomfortable with their father being a woman in the name of living the truth. I remember one of my sons saying, how could you think God made a mistake? And the title of the film is, I was not born a mistake. And I said, I said, Doug Bear, Dooley, I never said to you that God made a mistake. I never said, you, that's, you're putting those words in my mouth. We're all born with the need to do a tikkun. But they felt that my tikkun, be, in, be, be it that that's what I refer to it as, even if they agreed intellectually, emotionally, they just could not get on board. It was really too hard. And I wanna share with you that it's not just because of what's in the documentary. I never really discussed it in the documentary, but I discuss it now. I feel more, I can trust my own vulnerability. It's not because of my transition. It's really, there was a 10 year period from 1991 to 2001 where I, was, where I left the Torah world and I even left Israel with my head down, not wanting to. And in that 10 year period, I made serious mistakes as a parent that hurt my children. So by the time this came into their lives and I discussed it with each one of them, it was almost like, really? When is it gonna stop? There was no, they felt betrayed. They felt, they really felt abandoned by me. And they were, and that was a very hard pill for me to swallow. So you don't see it in the documentary, but I share that now when I speak about that. Now, I said, I wanna emphasize the filming stopped in 2000, came to a completion in 2017. It's now three years later, well, this past Shabbat, 
One of my daughters was here with my son-in-law and two of her six children, and my other daughter who lives in Rehavia, not too far from here. We had the most amazing Shabbat together. A lot has changed. My two sisters and their families who live in New York, and because of Corona, obviously I'm not traveling to see them. My father's birthday is in two days. He's in his 90s and I may have a stream. I won't be able to celebrate with my sisters and them. But we have now, we have reconnected over the past few years. We're closer now than we ever were. They did not speak to me for years. And when they saw the film, when it premiered in Lincoln Center in Manhattan, which was the last time I was in Chutz Laaretz, uh, I was there for the premiere of the, of the film outside of Israel. It premiered here in December, premiered in New, in New York in, in January. They said to me, whenever you talk, would you do us a favor and make sure the audience knows that it was not because you transitioned that we had a problem with you. And it really was for the same reason as my children. So I'm going, I will speak with them later tonight and I will be proud to tell them that authentically I remained faithful to their request of me, but they had a lot of problems when I was making bad decisions that affected my children. And now we are so close. We are, we're closer now than we ever recall we ever were. Each week we have a three-way chat. We catch up on our kids, our grandchildren, uh, situations. Of course, I think they tell me I know everything about the political landscape in America from them. And it's wonderful. And my other children, uh, I have a, my other daughter who's in the States. We chat once in a while. Uh, and my three sons, they're, they're taking their time. But it's changed a lot. It's really, I feel like this is a miracle. This is so much, this is so beyond, beyond what I ever imagined could ever have been. Yeah. Uh, do you think that um, any of that would have happened without the documentary? You know, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. A part of me wants to say yes, and a part of me wants to say, of course not. Because what the documentary did for them was it gave them a sense of the world sees her in a way we don't. And that was always in my TED talk, I begin my TED talk by saying the way I see myself, the way I always saw myself, no one else did. And the way everyone else saw me, I surely didn't. I felt with my children, the way the world sees me, they don't. And, and my siblings, my two sisters. And the way they see me, no one else in the world does. So I think the documentary, especially, if, especially because so many, you know, Israel's a small country. It's a very small country. I remember even when I gave the TED talk here in Yerushalayim, someone came up to me and said, I'm friends with your son, we're, we're Chavruta, and I know he's not here, but uh, he was glad to know that I was here, that I'm here to hear your TED talk. So they, they received these stimuli. <laughs> Again, Israel is a very small country, not only physically, but you know, we're all a family, we're a mishpacha, and we think everyone else's business is our business. So a lot of people made it clear to my children that either they saw the documentary, they heard of the documentary, it's amazing, you have to see it, and blah, blah, blah. And I think it kind of like began to melt the ice, <laughs> you know, began to thaw out the, the, the fear, their own hurt, their own disconnect. And my the daughter that I'm really, really very close with, she and her family live in Sur Hadassah. She said, I realized I was hurting myself by not going out on a limb. I was, I know you felt hurt, but that, but that, that didn't bother me as much. I'm hurting me. And then only after we became close, she said, well, I, I guess I really hurt you also because she saw how much love I have for her and her children. It's like, it's like getting a whole new family. You know, when she left me years ago, 12 years, we went without seeing each other, 12 years. She had a little baby. She came back to me with four children and I've been there for two more births. My two youngest grandchildren, I held each one of them at one day old. So 
is that I can't say for sure if it's because of the documentary. I think the documentary contributed in a positive way towards that. Beautiful, thank you. Um, I want to ask one more question um, about your your own experience and reflections um, before we we pivot to to applying it to modern day. Um, and one thing that uh, this is a question you had suggested, but I'm realizing now listening to what you're saying exactly how on the nose it is, um, because one of the questions you suggested is uh, what is what would you ask of traditional status quo rabbinic and educational leadership? of all movements, Israel, diaspora, wherever. And, and I, I'm realizing, especially listening to you, that one of the reasons these situations can become so corrupted and so painful and so alienated is because there's no one helping to steer a conversation or to help navigate the relationship and the challenges. Um, so yeah, where, where did you see leadership fail here? Um, and, and how would you suggest that people manage these types of situations that arise in family is all, you know, there's always complications. Um, so anything you have to, to share um, with uh, those of us who serve as leaders, those of us who are just family members and, and have relationships with people. Yeah, look, we're all leaders <laughs> in one way or another. We have children, we have parents, we're in communities. You know, not all of us are rabbis, not all of us are educators, but we're all leading and we're all following in one capacity or another. At work, maybe some of you here in the, in the Zoom room have positions of power and leadership in your work environment. So my ask is the same, but I do want to preface it with one example that was so hurtful, so, so hurtful. My daughter, who Sarah, who was the one who took the, the first step that I told you about. Years ago, and she told me this many, much later, years ago, she was more Haredi, and she asked her Rav, what do I do? How do I interact with my father, who is now a woman? And he gave her an answer that probably pushed her away from me for many more years. This person is not worthy of kibud avayim. Kibud avayim. I mean, how does a rav? I know halachically there are very few examples when one is patur from uh, being obligated to fulfill the mitzvah of kibud avayim. A parent transitioning is not one of them. He he distinctly he clearly told her, "You owe him her it nothing." And for her to hear that, it, it didn't hurt me nearly as much as what it meant to her. Now, it's not enough that she's dealing with her own inner demons and her own hurt. Now, it's someone she looks towards for inspiration, for direction, for help. He could have equally said, you know, maybe the two of you should have a chat. Maybe you can send an email and talk about your feelings, like he could have done so much. So this is my ask of leadership, is be there to help, be there to really provide what followers need, which is a role model to help navigate through the difficult times. As one rabbi once told me several years ago, he said, you know, my wife and I, we uh, very like Haredi couple that I met when I was in the States. And he said, you're just so nice. You're smart and you're, you're like elegant and you're such a nice woman and blah, blah, blah. He said, but you know, this is really difficult for us. This is really uncomfortable for us. And my reply was, and, and, okay. <laughs> and he said, we really have a situation. I said, no, we don't. You have a situation. I had a situation. Now, if you want my help, that's different. But if you're trying to make it seem that it's my fault, you need to role model to the community what you do when you're uncomfortable, not what you do when you're comfortable. You know, Louis Jacobs, the, the founder of the Maserati movement in London many years ago, 
who had his own problems with the Orthodox uh, establishment, he wrote a very beautiful, beautiful uh, quote. He said, Halakha was never meant to comfort the, the disturbed. It was meant to disturb the comfortable. I said, what? I said, Rabbi so-and-so, you, po you, you posture yourself as a leader. You want me to feel sorry for you? You think this is the first time a Jewish leader is in an uncomfortable position? My ask of leaders is that tell your congregation, tell your, your, your community, tell your students, you know what? Such and such a situation was brought to, to light. And you know what? I told the person, it makes me feel uncomfortable. Now I want to teach, what do we do when we are uncomfortable? We role model Havat Yisrael. We role model compassion. We don't have to role model agreement. I told this rabbi, you don't even have to understand my personal story because you won't. But you can role model the Reacha Kamocha. If you can't role model it, who will? because everyone in your community, everyone in your classroom, all of your students are looking at you for the signal, for the sign. What do we do? There's a child, there's an older person, there's all types of disabilities, all types of disorders, all types of challenges. I remember when my daughter, my, my oldest daughter was born in Sfat and she was born deaf and we lived in the Haredi community. And we had to make an appointment, um, several appointments ongoing with an audiologist. He actually asked us, do you, uh, do you want it at two in the morning or two in the afternoon? I said, two in the morning? Who's going to bring my daughter for an exam at two in the morning? He said, not everyone is as open as you. I said, open about what? She's my daughter. He said, well, there are some people who don't want the community to know that their daughter is deaf or their son. So they have special appointments with me in the dark, like they're sneaking. I mean, I've, I'm not even talking transgender here. So the leaders are responsible for that to have created a situation where a family, it's enough that they have to deal with a child being deaf. Now they have to hide it as if it's a source of shame and embarrassment, that's my ask. My ask is to role model. Every era of Tisha B'Av during the nine days, they're very quick to say, you know, why did we lose the second temple? Why haven't we built the third temple because of Sinat Chinam? Well then role model, Ahavat Chinam. And if you're not up, and this is my second ask, and I say this with compassion, I don't say with anger, but I say it with commitment and meaning. If you're not up for the challenge, maybe it's time you resign. Because the harm you are causing is so serious. I have, I have met with parents of transgender. I have met with children whose parents are trans, like in my situation. I, and, and the harm that their leaders, they're already in a difficult position. So my ask is show compassion. Show support for the family, for your community. You don't have to agree. This is the, you don't have to say the halakha should change. This has nothing to do with halakha. This has to do with a heart, with heart. And we'll deal, we'll negotiate how to halakhically navigate through this. But the person and the family needs to feel safe, needs to feel, well, my rabbi has my back. My rabbi, my rebbetzin, they're for me because I'm part of the community and they want me to stay in the community. I've met people who were, who were raised here in Yerushalayim from birth. They, they have been marginalized. They've been excluded as if they're strangers. They're not welcome to even come into the synagogue anymore. At 22, 24, 25 years old. It's heartbreaking. So that's my ask. You mentioned in the documentary that um, I think you, I forget the exact word you used, but that you're basically the mother of so many people who either are transgender or, or are facing other struggles in life and have been alienated from their families. And uh, listening to you, I really <laughs> totally understand how that happened. <laughs> um, and I admire the, the confidence and this self-assuredness that, that you just project so warmly. Um, and at the same time, I know that it, 
it has, you have and had many struggles in your life. And so um, as we pivot to talking about uh, us um, and, and what, what lessons you've learned from, from all of the challenges you faced in your life, um, I, I would love to hear from you. Um, actually, I'll, I'm, I'll put both of these questions out there and you can decide um, how you'd like to, to devote your time to them. So the first is the, the more obvious one that I opened with, which is, we're in a very dark time, right? And, and many of us have faced many challenges um, in our lives and many of us are facing new challenges in our lives and are finding ourselves in such a, a different space. And, and I would really love to hear from you some tools that, spiritual tools, uh, and I know this is really your area of expertise that you can recommend um, for us, for those of us who are, are facing new lit, new places of darkness that, that we haven't yet encountered. And then if, if you have time, if, if you would like um, to, to add this question as well, I'm really struck by how you speak of the role that the documentary played in your life and by showing your story in a different way and therefore you seeing it differently and also the people in your life seeing it differently. And um, I'm sure many of us um, here today have felt at different times that we're being misunderstood. And um, absent us each having a documentary made about <laughs> each of ourselves, um, I, I would love if you can share any any wisdom you've learned from this and, and how, on ways to, new ways to communicate ourselves um, to each other uh, and to perhaps reframe certain things. Like how, how could we, we make the equivalent of those documentaries um, for ourselves and for the people in our lives? So I will, I will hand those two questions over to you and let you answer um, how you would like. And then with the, the remaining time at the end, we'll, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Are you, are you there? Are you frozen for a moment? Oh, there you are. Okay. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. Okay. Excellent. Take it away. <laughs> all right. So can you all hear me okay? Right. Okay. So I'd like to address the first question first and the second question second. Right. So how do we navigate through times of darkness? And by the way, it is, we just celebrated, well, I guess by you in DC, it's the Rosh Chodesh. So I could say Chodesh Tov. It's the Chodesh of Kislev. When, after the winter solstice, we begin to move through, you know, towards the end of Hanukkah, we're moving into the, actually, the days become longer. Kislev is the holiday of light, of light in the darkness. And there's something to be said why we light the, the, the lights, then they wrote Hanukkah, Dafka at night, to, to, to push away that darkness. There's even a phrase in the Midrash, and this is, will be a lead into some of the guidance that I provided, that ma'at or gashmi docheha bevenachoshech, that a little bit of physical light can put, push away a lot of darkness. You know, if you sit outside, it's a sunny day, and you light a candle, no, you're not going to see any better. But in a room at night, that same candle will light up the whole room. And not because we push violently against the darkness, but we, with patience, we allow our eyes to adjust, and we see how the light naturally Darkness cannot stand up to light. If you measure the volume of a room that's all dark and you light one little candle, within a few minutes, the whole room is light. So I want to use that as my metaphor. Also combined the teachings from the PSS Narebi, the Eish Kodesh, Rabbi Kalamanis, Kalamanis Kalma Shapira, although no one refers to him by that. Uh, he teaches in B'nai Machshavat which is his book about cultivating higher consciousness. What he means by cultivating higher consciousness is cultivating a way of thinking and feeling where first of all, they're in harmony with each other rather than at odds with each other. That's more of a lower consciousness. But what it does is it allows, if we think with our feelings, if we think with our heart and we feel with our mind, we bring harmony 
We then, little by little, in the Beit HaKnesset, in the Beit Midrash, when we're observing mitzvot, when we're saying brachot, and then out of the formal observance of Judaism, we then even begin more in the rest of the world. We're shopping, we're raising a family, we're at work, we're, we're, we're doing whatever we're doing. We sense the divine presence more in our lives. That is for him what's essential. And he calls that moving from feeling distant, rachok, to feeling karov. It's cultivating his kavut. And he uses as the mashal, the son of a maidservant, who he himself becomes a servant of the king. And he lives in a hamlet far away from the palace. And he, he, he is commanded to grind away at the millstone all day. And as an obedient subject of the king, he grinds and grinds and grinds. I'm wondering if this is where the expression came from. I'm grinding all, I'm, I'm grinding all day at work and I'm getting nowhere. The, the PSS said he never sees the king. He never hears the king. He never gazes at the majesty, at the ambiance of being close to the king in the palace. He said, that's not what we want. We want to be like the king's child. And he quotes in Devarim, where it says in Deuteronomy, Atem banim l'Hashem alokechem. Yes, God is my king. And yes, I'm required to be obedient and obey my king. But the king is also my father. Avinu malkenu. We don't say malkenu avinu. We say avinu malkenu. So as a child growing up in the palace, I sit on my father's lap. I hear my father sing. I gaze the majesty of my father being the king. I feel close. So one of the ways in this book, B'nai Mach Tova, one of the ways, one of the techniques that he teaches in how to elevate consciousness, to gain that sense of closeness, is to use every feeling that you are experiencing as a key, as a mafteach. We have hearts. Behind the heart is, so to speak, our soul. But if our heart is what he refers to as tintum halev, the dullness of the heart, it's like a closed heart. And again, also in Sefer Devarim, it's, one, it's an amazing mitzvah that a lot of people read by and they don't, they don't even remember reading it or even commenting on it. There's a second type of circumcision. We all know what happened with Avraham Avinu, not that long, not that, what, two parshiot ago? But what, there's a different, there's another kind of circumcision. There's another kind of mila. And that is the circumcision of the orla of the heart. Over the heart. And all of us are commanded to actually perform that type of circumcision. To be more vulnerable, to move from the Malev to Shivarat Alev to then Petichat Alev. How do we do that? And it's interesting because it may be the only mitzvah of the 613 Tayyarg mitzvot that after God commands us in one parsha, right in Parshat Netzavim, right before Rosh Hashanah, God says, I'll help you fulfill this. This is hard work. It's maybe the only mitzvah where God says, I also will help you circumcise the foreskin over your heart. Because you're getting ready to come to me for Rosh Hashanah. You have to be spiritually naked and vulnerable. So what the PSS employs is the realm of feelings. Not so much, and he was a Talmud Chacham, he knew Shulchan Aruch backwards and forwards with all the codes, the Rishanin, Achronim, all the Shas. However, he said, whatever is going on up here, we have more control over. We have no control over our feelings. We are required, or it's expected that we control our behavior as a response to our feelings, but we don't decide to feel hot or cold, good or bad. That's the realm of the soul. And he, and that's the cult of Mamantaka, that's the still small voice that's speaking to us. So he gives these examples. What happens when you feel 
despairing, when you feel sad, when you feel disappointment, when you feel angry, when you feel betrayed, when you feel let down, when you feel confused, when you feel overwhelmed. Does that sound familiar now? Now, this was written before the Shoah. This was written in between, like the late 1920s into the early 30s. It was before World War II. And this, he's teaching this to his chevra, to his chassidim. Don't run away from your feelings. Don't deny your feelings. You need to hold the spiritual language of holding space, having a metza, a platform. You can use, not so you can stay angry or stay sad or stay confused. None of us want to stay there. That's what, many times why we run away from them. We don't want them to define us. We don't want them to control us. So his answer is, well, then don't. Use it as a key. What do you do? What can we all do now when we feel confused? What can we all do now when we feel bewildered? We can go deep inside and talk to the Shekhinah inside of us. He gives examples of King David. Look at Tehillim. There's so many prakim of Tehillim where King David goes inside and speaks to God. God, I'm so, I feel so defeated. I feel so forsaken. I'm being pursued. Help me. He actually has these mini scripts of helping us talk to God and put all of our feelings out there. I'm scared. Yes, I believe in you, but I feel so alone right now. I don't feel your presence. I need to feel your presence. And he, and he shows us, and it works. If you dedicate time, this is uh, my pitch for meditation and contemplative practice. It really works, though. In addition to tefillah, this is not instead of tefillah. I might, look, I don't know who dolphins what here. That's, your, that's between you and God. But what I'm going to suggest can only enhance the communal prayer experience. It won't detract from it, that's for sure. Is you need to dedicate a certain amount of time every day. It could be two minutes. You know, two minutes every day is a lot worth more than a whole than once a week for an hour of just sitting. I'm not even going to go into meditation. Just sitting with yourself. Just be by yourself and talk to God. Say, I am, this is how I'm feeling right now. I do believe in you. I know that you love me, but I need you to be a little bit closer. I need to feel that I'm not walking through this world alone, that you're not far from me, that you're close. So this is my first tool that I suggest to all of my clients, to all of my students, to my friends, to my children, is dedicate. It's a, like a hakasha. You're dedicating time for you. You know, we're so busy taking care of our families, taking care of our job responsibilities, taking care of communal expectations. I'm sure everyone in this room, we have now 45 people, well, including me, but I, I'm already doing it. So with me, there's 45 of us that can find a few minutes every day, get up a little bit earlier, take a shorter lunch break. I don't know, I can't judge, I'm not judging, but I do believe that this is the first step the second step, once you don't feel as alone, that right there, I mean, this is basic psychology. This is not, I mean, I don't know how the PSS, now, Hasidic Rebbe, had such insight into, this, into the human situation of how painful loneliness is. Any, anything in life is worse when you feel lonely. So let's say we're moving into that space of feeling, I feel a little bit closer. I feel my own Judaism, my own soul, I'm feeling a little bit more connected. Well, then the next question, now that you've answer, asked and answered the question, God, where are you? Is to ask God, well, okay, I'm feeling miserable right now. There's economic unrest, political unrest, turbulence, people have died, people are suffering. And I'm going to quote, not a Torah source for this, but very much supportive of what the PSS teaches. This is Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning. Now they both lived at the same period of time. Uh, Viktor Frankl, as many of you may know, was a secular psychiatrist in Vienna. The PSS was a Hasidic Rebbe in Warsaw. 
the Piazesna was murdered in 1943 in Chorinki. Viktor Frankl made it out of Auschwitz. And one of the reasons he made it out of Auschwitz intact, whatever that means, I don't know how someone could leave Auschwitz intact, I have no idea, but he felt he did in one way or another, is that as a psychiatrist, he knew he needed to be challenged. So he did, he studied his, uh, his, his uh, bunk mates. So those who were not chosen for, for, uh, in the selection to, to be murdered in the gas chambers, he noticed that there was a period of time when they would fall to despair and within 72 hours, they died. There were other people older, it had nothing to do with whether they believed in God or not, although he, that's what he says. I'm not so 100% convinced, but that, this is what he said. There were people more frail, people more this, more that, and yet they made it out of Auschwitz. So what was the difference? He believed that the people who perished within, and, and it came, he saw the behavior, and studying this is what kept him alive. And that was part of what he's going to teach us now that I am going to transmit from the book. Very, very important. He said, the people that, that gave into despair never changed the question that they were asking when they went in. And when they went into Auschwitz, the question was, what we all ask when we're not in Auschwitz, what does the world have to offer me? What does life have to offer me? They got to a point where the answer was nothing. The world has nothing to offer me. Now the other people who made it were starving just like they were, were freezing just like they were, were sick just like they were, were abused just like they were, but they switched the question. And this is my second piece of, uh, I don't wanna say advice, of guidance. What was the switch of the question? Instead of saying, what does life have to offer me? What is life? And as Jews, we would say, what is Hashem asking of me? What is being asked of me now? I dare say, I'm going out on a limb. If every one of you in this room, and if there's 44, 44 people, you'll come up with 44 answers, different answers you will feel differently about what's going on around you. It's not to change. No one, now when he asked what was being asked of him was to do this study. And it became a book of called Logotherapy. He, he wrote it, produced it. And it's trans, this book, Man's Search for Meaning is translated into, I don't know how many languages. I don't know how many, but whatever I would come up with more than that. And it's a therapy he, it's a therapy that he devised called logotherapy. And it's man's search for meaning, not man's search for comfort. He says right in the beginning, that's the biggest mistake we make. I'll go back to the Russian refusniks. Were they comfortable? No. Were they, did they seek and receive meaning in their lives? Yes. So my challenge to you is to seek meaning in the middle of all this. Does it change the situation around you? It surely didn't change what was going on in Siberia. It surely didn't change what was going on in Auschwitz. We don't do it to change something outside of us. We do it to change something inside of us. And actually the PSS and the beliefs we're not even changing inside. We are revealing what's already there. We were created to succeed. We were created in the image of God. And I'll go back to the very beginning. It's already after, I wanna be mindful of the time. By being created, B'Tselem Elohim, you know, in Israel, when you go into a clothing store, the label usually says, especially if you're paying a good price, Sug Aleph. There's also Sug Bet. I think in the States it's called, um, I don't even know what it's called in English anymore. Seconds. Like, let's say the button is in the wrong place or there's a missing this or, so it'll be discounted. When we were created by each one of us, when we were conceived in the mother's womb, all of us, there's no sugabet. 
no sug bet. So we're not victims. We're not victims of life. We are part of circumstances that we don't control. And actually, we've never controlled. This is the biggest dimyon shav. Rabbi Nachman says this is like the false illusion to think we really control that which goes on around us. If anything, Corona, COVID has taught us is how much we really don't control around externally. But in here, we can control everything. So the question is, find a meaning. What is being asked of you? What do you need to cultivate? What do you need to do to get up tomorrow morning and really say muda ani and mean it? Now that doesn't mean that we're supposed to be happy with, with what's going on in the world. I'm not happy. I can't see my sisters and father. I can't join you in your community in DC. I would love to be with you in the same room, but I can go one of two ways. I could feel poor me, woe to me, or you know what? I can do it a different way. I can teach on Zoom. I can meet with my sisters twice, a, once a week. I can make sure when my father is visiting because he's not going to do Zoom at 94 years old, but he'll be with my, one of my sisters. So I can see him and say, dad, I love you. That's what's being asked of me, stretching myself, going from the comfort zone to the discomfort zone. And I'll ask all of you friends, many of you are parents, you have children, all of you were children, or you have nieces and nephews. We all know that is from, from an infant to a baby, to a toddler, to when that toddler begins to really toddle and run around the house, it's always because the child was uncomfortable. We never grow from being comfortable. So the, the question is, okay, God, clearly the world is not comfortable right now and it's affecting me financially, it's affecting my health, it's affecting this, that, whatever. I can't see this one, I haven't seen that. How can I grow from this? Help me, God. Again, you give yourselves a few minutes. Believe in it. Trust it. That's what you can do. You do have agency over that. You have shlita over that. We have bechirach of sheet. Bechirach of sheet never was meant to think we can control the world. I want it to be sunny today instead of cloudy. God, I want it to be sunny. Make it sunny. That's not free will. It's what do I do when it's not sunny and I was hoping it would be sunny. I have free will to decide what to do about that. That's me, what I do about me. That's my main, main uh, kernel. And it's really in companionship with giving ourselves moments of privacy, of private solitude. And my third and final, because I like to do things in threes, it's a chazaka is after, while you start coming up with your answers, <laughs> encourage and support everyone around you. You know, it's so important now to be there for each other. My gosh. You know, I do meditations online where I'm sitting in meditation with people from every continent on the planet. Why do we do that? I don't, I don't need to, I can sit on my meditation bench in my home because there's an energy transference. Even though it's Zoom, there's still energy. And right now, as I see people's body language, as I see people's faces, we're connecting. So it'd be great if more people would show their faces. I'm not asking you to, but it'd just be nice. When we meditate together, when we do what we can within the, within the hanchayot, within the guidelines, the health guidelines, show support. You know, I'm over 60 years old. I'm sure you all can see that, although I feel very young. I get a call from an organization in Israel that, that, is, that really, it was produced through Corona. I get a call once a month. We wanna make sure that you're okay. Do you need anything? We have a whole battery of volunteers. Do you need any shopping? Do you need help? I mean, I'm very healthy, thank God, and I'm very, have a youthful energy, but they don't know that. They just know that I'm a, that I am a senior citizen. So they call me and I, she called me today 
I said, Baruch Hashem, I have some children, I have my students, I have, and I really am very fine. But tis kila mitzvot, kala kavod, that you're calling up a stranger and asking, can we be of help? What, but there's other kinds of help, and you don't have to be 63 or above for that kind of help. Spiritual support, emotional support. Call up a friend, call up a neighbor. You want to have a virtual cup of coffee together? Let's have, let's each make, a, let's have a drink. Let's have a glass of wine together, a happy hour. How can I support you? How can I encourage you? Or can I ask you to encourage me? That's a big, big, you know, there's nothing, the way to feel better is always to help another person. And we can do that virtually. Yeah. So those are my, that's my three points, my three pointed answer. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you are. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot to think about. So I see that that we had called the event to end in just a couple of minutes. And so I think with your permission, if it's okay, I guess I'll formally close the space and thank you so much. And then if folks who um, need to go can go and then if, if folks can stay, are you available for a Q and A for 10 minutes or so? Would that be okay? Sure, yeah, oh, yeah. Beautiful, excellent. So before we move- going anywhere. Awesome, well, I know it's, it's getting late for you over there, right? Um, so, uh, so just to, uh, just to close, I really wanted to thank you so much um, for sharing your story with yeah. us and your Torah and your wisdom. Um, it's really been an absolute pleasure and thank you so, so much. Uh, if anyone would like the sources from today, please just email myself, um, Rabbi Herzfeld, Rabbi Cooper, Rabbi Antin, <laughs> Rabbi Topolowski, and we will be very happy to share. It's a lot of rabbis. Um, and, and yeah, and really, and, and thank you so much. And perhaps, um, Yiskai, you can also in the chat, or, or I know you have podcasts and other resources, maybe it's just easiest to go to your website um, to see all the different ways um, that, that you, that people can, can learn more from you. Yeah, mm -hmm. actually, I'll, I'll just put in my website now, and I do two podcasts a month. I'm just going to release one this week, so it's not too late to sign up. Uh, let's see, hold on. <laughs> and if um so i okay great beautiful just went through excellent so um folks can follow that link and yeah so so if if you need to run run and if not um you can either unmute yourselves if anyone has a question or you can type it in the chat so thank you i'm gonna thank stop you all thank now. you all yeah shalom shalom let me know